I'll talk to you today about ministry without sanctification. Um, I can tell you now, I've been in full-time ministry for many, many years, over 10 years now. And um, I can tell you that I've seen a lot of people that try to get into full-time ministry and they fail miserably at it. And it's because they, you can learn a lot of, of Scripture, especially from this ministry and things. The Lord's helped me to, to really get a lot of information out to people. Um, and you can learn a lot. You can say, okay, I'm ready for ministry now. Um, there's some sanctification that has to happen. All right, I want to talk about that today in this, in this study. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We'll go there first. Um, Full-time ministry is not something that should be lightly considered, something that you should just simply say, oh, you know, I have so many neat things I want to tell people, so I'm just going to go right into it. I'm going to be in full-time ministry and, and whatever else. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 through 26. Make sure to follow along in your paper King James Bible, unless you don't have access to one right now, but I would definitely make that a big priority in your life to have a paper King James Bible. Uh, the online ones can be changed. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19-26 through 26. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Um, how's that going to happen when you first get saved? You just automatically just, boom, done with all the sins of your pet? No, it, it takes some time. The Lord will be very gentle as a father to a child, and He will lead you along and will say, okay, now that needs to go, now this needs to go, I'm going to help you with this. Lord, Lord is very gentle with the process of sanctification, unless you disobey. <laughs> then it can be kind of rough. Verse 20, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Hmm. You're to purge yourself? Give up sin? Yeah. There are things in your life when you get saved that you're going to realize, I need to get rid of this stuff. I need to stop doing this. Um, you're not ready for full-time ministry until you've gone through that process. I'm not saying you have to wait till you're perfect. Okay? Um, but there needs to be uh, a few years between salvation and full-time ministry. And if you get into it too quickly without getting rid of some of that stuff, it's going to be a problem. Verse 22, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and unlearned questions, knowing that they do gender strifes. That's going to take some time. Okay? You first get into ministry, you're going to get a lot of that, those foolish and unlearned questions, and you're going to have to have that maturity to just avoid those things and just say, no, I'm not going to answer that, you know. Another one that takes time is here, verse 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. You'll get people that are so hateful that will attack you sometimes as a Christian. Um, and what you need to realize is when you mature, you won't let it hurt your feelings as much anymore because you're going to realize these people are opposing themselves. You'll feel bad for them. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Yeah. But you see there the thing of a vessel prepared. Um, I have some of my son's uh, Play-Doh here. I just want to illustrate a point. Here's the lump of clay. That's the new Christian. Is this lump of clay ready to hold any water? Is it a vessel? No. What's it going to take? The master has to start to form and start to mold and move with his fingers and starts to prepare a vessel. You see, doing a pretty poor job of it, but <laughs> you see what I'm, the point I'm trying to make. You say, well, great, now we have, we have a vessel. Now it's a nice little bowl here that I'm forming. There you go. There's a bowl like that. You can, it'll hold water now, right? Uh, no, because it needs something else. 
Um, when you're dealing with clay, this is not clay, it's just Play-Doh, but when you're dealing with clay, um, you form it, and you don't form it with your hands like that necessarily. You have this potter's wheel and whatever else. I used to be a wood-turning artist, and so I had a similar thing with wood, spinning the wood, and you're taking tools, and you're carving it, you know, shavings away. But I actually exhibited a lot of times with potters and things because pottery and wood turning are very similar. And uh, so I'm very familiar with the process. But they have the spin, spinning wheel and they take water and they put on the clay and they're, they're full, forming it and molding it and whatever else. And then they get it done and they have this vessel. But what does that vessel need? It needs to be put in the fire. First Peter chapter 4. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4, verse 11 through 18. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. In other words, you speak, you speak Scripture. You know, what God has written, not your own thoughts and your own intelligence. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. That's going to take some time. The Lord's not going to get you saved and then just boom right into the fiery trial, trial right away. You'll experience some persecution pretty early on when you first get saved, when you're born again, sure. But the real fiery trial will come later. The time of, you know, Lord only knows what. It can come in a lot of different ways. Run-ins with the law, people calling the police on you and whatever else. Uh, people openly persecuting you, chasing you out of things and trying to get you arrested and, and you know, whatever. Taking your job from you. Uh, a lot of married people go through a divorce and whatever else because the one member's not going to get saved. The other one got saved. I mean, there's there's some real fiery trials that you'll, you'll go through. And it's there to harden you as a Christian. Verse 13, what do you do when you go through it? But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? That's another thing that you're going to realize as you get older as a Christian. The righteous are scarcely saved. I mean... You'll see, you know, righteous people that are born again, they're going to heaven. But good night, that life of sanctification is terrible. I've seen that thing for years and years and years. And there's a lot of people that I think, yeah, born again, definitely going along fine. And all of a sudden they just go whoop, off in some direction. And I think, what in the world? You know, I, I knew that they were saved. I, I was positive that they were saved. And then I start kind of scratching my head going, I think that they're saved. You know, I just have to kind of put them in a question mark folder. and I don't know. Saved or lost, I have no idea. Uh, you, can, you can live like a lost person and uh, be saved. But you're going to see a lot of things there, you know. But you can hear my studies on the marks of a false convert and stuff like that. So not going to get into all that. But let's go next to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter four, verses five through ten. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Hmm. That the, excellent, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That doesn't happen right away, brethren. That takes some time. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. 
persecuted but not forsaken, cast down but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest, or might yeah, might be made manifest in our body. Um, <clears throat> you're gonna part of the fiery trial is you're gonna go through what Jesus went through. Now you might not die on the cross, you know, and, you know physically speaking, but uh, you're gonna have people that cast out your name as evil. One minute they're praising you, saying you're a great person. Next minute they're attacking you. You're going to have this type of thing. You're going to have people that were friends, you thought Christian friends, and then they turn out to be a Judas Iscariot. You're going to have that type of a thing. Um, why? Well, because Jesus Christ is putting you through some things. He's preparing you as a vessel. You see? We have a treasure in this earthen vessel. And that treasure is the truth. The truth of God's Word. You say, but uh, I thought we all had the ministry of reconciliation. Well, jump right over here to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. We all have the ministry of reconciliation, in other words. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Okay? So, we all have that ministry of reconciliation. As soon as you get saved, you have the ministry of reconciliation. You can tell people how Jesus Christ saved you. Witness for Jesus Christ, certainly. But when it comes to full-time ministry... If you get into full-time ministry without that process of sanctification happening first and the Lord helping you to get rid of a lot of those sins of your past and getting victory over those sins, you're going to make a mess of your life. Okay? There needs to be some maturity before you get into full-time ministry. Let me show you that. 1 Timothy chapter 3. You know, I know it's it's a, a neat thing to want to serve the Lord, and, and and I can speak from experience that it is a a wonderful thing to serve, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, but it's rough sometimes. It's very rough. And uh, I'll show you some of the qualifications here. First Timothy chapter three verses one through seven. This is a true saying: If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. No female preachers. Okay. Just as simple as that. No female pastors. Bishop is another word for pastor or elder would be another way of saying it. A bishop then must be blameless. Huh? Well, that means sinless perfection. No, it doesn't mean sinless perfection. But what it means is you can't have a bunch of, of bad things that you haven't gotten victory over sin-wise. You're still going to struggle with the flesh. That's there. Absolutely. Anybody does. But if you have a problem... When you get saved with, you know, go down through the list, drunkenness or, or smoking or drugs or, you know, different types of addictions. And video games are a very serious addiction, by the way. I, I know that there's been a lot of talk about that and things. And, and people say, well, I'm just a casual video game player. Uh, it's no different than a casual drunkard or whatever else. I used to be a video game addict, I know. Video games are not designed for you just to sit down and play them for a few minutes and you get up and walk away. They're designed to draw you in. And I've never met a video gamer that can't just that can just play and just stop at a really exciting point. You say, oh nuts, I'm almost beating the level here. I just gotta get to the end of the level. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, another thing I'd like to, to point out. Um, how long if you're if you're messing around with video games, like I once did, um, how long are you gonna, how long are you gonna do that? Are you going to get to a point where you're 80 years old or something like that and still playing video games? When are you going to grow up? You know, I had to come under conviction of that stuff myself. I was playing up, up, up into my 30s, you know, and uh, early part of my ministry I was playing video games. And the Lord convicted me of that and said, you, you need to stop. You need to quit. You need to get some victory over that. And the Lord will allow you to go into some levels of ministry, but He's not going to get you, you know, He's not going to use you like he could until you've gone through that process of sanctification, get some of that stuff out of your life. And you'll get to a point when you, you say, you know what, I want to be used of the Lord 
um, completely. And I want, you know, all to Jesus. I surrender all to him. I freely give, you know. So, uh, you know, uh, think of the old hymn there. But you're going to want to do that. And if you're going to be in full-time ministry, you better get used to the thing of saying, hey, I, I need to get rid of all this stuff. I can't mess around with any of this. And if I have something in my life that I'm struggling with, I need the Lord's help to get this out of my life. And there needs to be some fear there saying, if I don't get rid of this, I'm afraid of what the Lord might do to me. Verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless, as we read before. The husband of one wife. It's hard to be the husband of one wife. <laughs> um, it's a struggle. Paul wrote about that back in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I believe it is, where it talks about, you know, uh, you'll have trouble in the flesh when you get married. You will. You will. But you get through that. You grow up and you're a man and you say, you know what? Um, you take those times when you have an argument with your wife and you realize actually it was your own pride that started that argument or whatever else and you have to humble yourself and you have to work on that marriage and things like that. That's important. And that's what the Lord wants for a man who's a bishop. A man that can be a good husband. And we'll see here also a good father. Vigilant. Are you vigilant? Does that happen right away? It takes time. Sober, hmm, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children, children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Yeah. You got to keep your family together, and you'll notice, by the way, too, as a Christian, as a Christian man, that's if you're married, you have a saved wife, and and you know, have children and things, um, you're going to notice the devil attacking, many times, and as a man, you can't just def, you know hide in the closet and you say to your hun to your wife, honey, go take care of that. No, you have to be the one that goes out and takes care of things, and uh, eliminates threats and things like that. You know, physically and spiritually, I'm talking about. You have to be a protector of your wife and your children. It makes you grow up. It matures you. You know, I mean, I like I said, I used to be a, a big-time video game player, and I'd like to watch movies and things way, way back. I gave up movies when I got saved, but, you know, the point is um, I liked entertainment. And uh, the older I get, the, the less I even care for any kind of entertainment. I, I mean, right now, I think it'd be dull to sit down and play a video game because I've been, you know, I've had victory over that, you know, addiction for many, many years now. And I want more. I want more sanctification. I want the Lord to do more in my life to clean up my life and to clean up things and to say, hey, stop doing that and stop doing that. Verse 6. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. You young men out there, I know a lot of you are friends of this ministry. A lot of you, you know, follow this ministry. Please be careful. Please be very careful. Um, there's a lot of life lessons that you're just going to have to learn, and you're going to have. You can't read them in a book. You can't watch them in a video. You can't anything, because what happened to me in my past isn't going to happen to you. Um, you might go through some bad relationships. You might uh, get a job or whatever else that's going to be terrible. You might get a place that's going to be horrible or, or you get a vehicle that lets you sit someplace and you, and you get beat up or something like that. Or, there's all kinds of things that are going to happen in your life that don't happen in mine. And you just got to get through that stuff. And you got to mature as a Christian. You say, well, brother, what do I do? I want to be in full-time ministry someday. Okay. Yield to the Lord in the process of sanctification. Say, okay, Lord, just get down, get down on your knees. Do it right now. Don't even wait till the end of the video. Down on your knees, just pause this video, say, Lord, get down there and say, Lord, I want to be used by you. I want to dedicate my life to you. Um, if there's things in my life that are displeasing in your sight, tell me what they are. And then help me get victory over those things. Help me get that stuff out of my life. I want to be a full-time minister 
minister in full-time ministry someday. Please, Lord. I want to be that, that clay in Your hands. I want You to mold me and make me. Have Thine own way, Lord. Have Thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after Thy will while I am waiting, yielded and still. Like the old hymn says. Pray that. Verse 7, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall under reproach and the snare of the devil. Hmm. You mean lost people out there in the, in the secular world should actually have, there should be a good report about you? That means that you're not just going to be some jerk just yelling and screaming and, and, and horror, you know, whatever else, just trying to take people off. You're also going to have to develop a, a presence in your local area. You see somebody that needs help, you go help them. It's going to take time. That's the process of sanctification. Finally, we're going to end in Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. We're expecting uh, somebody here, so if I have to pause the video, just uh, I'll be back. <laughs> Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resist, resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. Hmm. Talking about secular, uh, like it would be law enforcement officers, officers and people like that. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Um, Ephesians chapter 6 talks about being a soldier for Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, enduring, uh, well, enduring hardness is a good soldier. Jesus Christ is 2 Timothy chapter 2. But um, we're to put on the whole armor of God and uh, in Ephesians chapter 6. Well, that's the ministry of reconciliation. Um, but soldiers are supposed to do two things, basically. Soldiers are supposed to kill the enemy and defend a position. If you want to break it down. Now, there's other things I realize, but those are the two main duties of a soldier. You know, well, make a third one to be follow orders, you know. Follow orders, kill the enemy, defend a position. Okay? Um, but a police officer is different than a soldier. Soldiers make good police officers most of the time, but uh, unless the guy's just totally whacked out, lost his mind in, in, on the battlefield or something, then he comes back and he's trying to you know, get a cat out of a tree or something like that, <laughs> you know? um, or, or quell domestic disturbance or something. Um, but I believe that a pastor, an elder, a bishop, in other words, is more like a police officer. Um, they have the law, and they're supposed to uphold the law. And they see things that are, that are wrong and whatever else. They have the letter of the law, but they also have to have some grace there. Why was that person speeding? Did they need to get up the hill, and they're carrying a heavy load? They, they broke the speed limit but they have to get up the hill. You see, you have these little things that come in as a law enforcement officer. And you'll have those things as a preacher. Um, why did that person, you know, why is this, this lady over here, why does she have short hair? Well, is it because she's trying to look like a man or is it because she got something stuck in her hair and she had to cut it short and she's waiting for it to grow back? You know, and I'm not saying you're a horrible, wicked sinner or something like that. It's just that a long hair on a woman is, you know, there as a glory to you what the Bible says. So if you don't have long hair, well, then there's no glory there. But the point is, see, as a preacher, 
you, you have to get older and you have to mature. You know, what's one of the most dangerous police officers out there? The rookie cop, what they say. Some young guy just out fresh out of the police academy and, and he's out there and he's got his, his little law book and everything else and he's just going to nail everybody for everything, at, every violation of the law. The older police officer that says, uh, no, I've been out here, I know these people. And he has a good report of them which are without. You see? The people don't fear officer so-and-so, sergeant so-and-so, you know. But they look at this other officer, this young guy, and it's, and it's very standoffish and whatever else. The officer needs to be there and he needs to be part of those people and he needs to show grace. Um, that's called sanctification. That officer has to be out there on that beat and he has to be able to show people that he's there to protect, to serve and protect them. And, and to be there uh, when the people hear the bump in the night. And to be there when the people need their cat taken out of the tree or the little boy needs to be told don't cross the road that way or don't, you know. And, and you're dealing with all these different things. And to be there when the guy, the crazy guy is running down the, through the neighborhood shooting at people, you know, and he's high on some drugs and the officer has no choice but to, to drop the guy. You have to learn all that stuff and it takes time. You can't have a police officer come in and say, here you go, here's all the experience. Watch, you know, watch cops or something like that, every episode of cops and then you qualify. Uh, no. <laughs> And if you're watching all these videos and all the teaching and preaching that I've done over the years, um, you don't qualify for full-time ministry. Okay? Let me just tell you that. Uh, there needs to be some sanctification. And it's the Lord that's going to lead you into that thing. And you can't come into full-time ministry as a mirror image of Brian Denlinger. You have to be the man that God wants you to be. Okay? Um, you have to let the Lord lead you. And a lot of times people ask me questions, young men, will, young men will ask me questions, and I'll try to direct and lead and whatever else as, as much as I can, but there are some things I can't answer. You just have to answer it for yourself. It's between you and God. Um, That's just the way it is. So uh, full-time ministry is a, is a very high calling, and um, I think it's something that, that a young man should consider and pray about. But uh, don't think for one second that the Lord's going to bless you and use you if you're not willing to go through that process of sanctification. Uh, many a police officer, going back to that analogy, many a police officer was shot in the line of duty because uh, he had some maturity issues. Um, he didn't make sure that the criminal that he had to shoot, unfortunately, uh, I heard a statement the one time, a self-defense firearm guy at Masad Ayub. I read his book years and years ago, and he said, um, the number one kind of criminal that'll kill you is the dead one. So what, huh, what are you talking about? Police officer coming into a house, clearing a house, and he shoots a bad guy with the gun, and he goes like this, and he turns his back, and that dead criminal turns out to be very much alive and shoots him. Okay? Um, there's a lot of things you have to learn, in other words, before you go into full-time ministry. So I do hope that this has been a challenge to you and pray about it. So that is going to be it. Thank you for watching.